Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitchell Lepp. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Brian Fuller from Power Rowing. I'm happy to be a part of the Break It Down show today and talk a little bit about uh, what's going on. Brian and I go back to the mid-90s. We are both in Germany in the Army together, and it has been... its Look, Brian, it's 25 years that we've known each other. It's unbelievable. Like, we were just kids. Yeah, it's been a long time. We used to <laughs> do all kinds of nonsense that young single dudes... We kind of have a bachelor playboy lifestyle where a lot of our money was spent on having fun and, and now yeah our kids are but kids are 25 that's how long we knew each other <laughs> there's a lot of memories in those 25 years and i, I don't want to jump in line in front of you because i know you've got some good ones and i've it's just always great to hear someone else's recollections of the same time frame so go ahead oh all right so look i, I gotta start with my, my favorite my favorite favorite all-time army story i gotta start with that one and it's crack you up it's gonna crack you up especially you and the listeners will be like you just have to bear with me for a second here so when i i first got the darm shop pete was already there so he was kind of my welcome committee and uh the very very first thing we we did uh, you know after just you know you know unloading all your stuff and stuff like that was train for a thing called nine megan and and nine megan is like this uh four day march all around the city of Nine Megan to kind of celebrate. It's a, a bunch of different things. Liberation of Nine Megan during World War II, and it even goes back farther than that. But it's a hundred day march, and they have all these soldiers there. And like, uh, uh, honestly, uh, it's primarily at this point to celebrate the American soldiers that helped liberate Nine Megan. And and, and Pete uh, signed me up for this, and that was my very first thing I did. Basically, at my very first destination unit was. March is 100 mile march of PP. Do you remember that march? Yeah, of course. So, look, a bunch of us wanted to try to go. And the thing is, is it turns out I've always been an organizer, and everybody's like, ah, you can't get a group of, of counterintelligence people to go. But sure enough, we did it. And I think we had a great time. That was, a, that was all, uh, maybe my best four days in the whole military happened in my first month. <laughs> yes, it's so true. And, uh, uh, the story I'm going to tell is, it, it's kind of a unique story. Uh, Pete will, uh, he's going to crack up when I tell him the story. But uh, so, so uh, every day you want, we watch, uh, march 25 miles and we were very much not the cohesive unit. Like first three days, we just all marched on our own. And cause uh, mo- most of the units showed up with like 50 guys and they're all in order and they'd carry a flag. And like, there was like, uh, uh nine of us and we were all IT, uh, am I, um, all, uh, uh, you know, spy guys, right? Uh, oh, uh, yeah. And so Intel guys. And um, so we don't nearly, we're not that whole good at that whole like marching together kind of thing. So we all kind of did our own thing for the first four days. But then ironically, on the last day, I think our commander showed up. He was going to see us off. And uh, for whatever reason, out of, out of the 250 or so odd units from around the world, Canada, you know, Japan was there, I think, Germany, Britain, Italy, all, every all units from all around the world. Of course, a bunch of American units there. And all the NATO's commanders were there because it's a big deal, you know. And uh, somehow our unit led the charge on the last day. And there was nine of us. We all had to line up together. And, and, and like, the, 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 the string of soldiers went back probably a half a mile. Because uh, you march as, as units together across this 25 miles. And so, yeah, so we went back like a half a mile, and our unit was way up in front. And, like, uh, everybody's feet was kind of a mess by the third day, uh, by the fourth day. And uh, you know, we taped it all up and everything, got all ready. And our, our unit was up front, and, and the generals all stood up, and we all stood up. And, and then, the, you know, the, they, they sounded the alarm, let's begin. And we started the march, and we marched 10 feet. And we had a, uh, at that time was... Uh, I guess specialist Saunders took 10 steps and went, oh, my feet, and fell down on his face right in front of all the major leaders. And then we sit there while he went, oh, my feet, for, for the next uh, probably a half mile. Units walked by us going, hey, you guys okay? Hey, you guys okay? Hey, you guys. Like, by about the third one, I was like, you know what? F you. <laughs> that was. 
but really though, after all that struggle on the last day to fall out immediately was, uh, it was terrible. Cause you're right. Those guys were absolutely fucking with us. I don't know. What, what's your experience? What do you think about that? Peter? It's probably the fucking military. Yeah. It was, so my experience was the same thing. You know, whenever you march in a group like this and there's a dignitary like we had is, um, you know, the unit goes by, you march and you, you actually are marching, march, march, march. And, and then the leader of the group goes, you know, to present honors, they say eyes, right. And then, you know, some of the people salute, some of them just look at the person and with respect and they go ready front, which means you're going to look back forward again. And then you can kind of relax because you've gone past the podium. So literally, the leader of our group goes, eyes right, step, step, ready, front, oh, and he fell out, like just clearing the bleachers at this point. And they had rank ordered us to be first because we were the slowest unit because we had completely exploded the day before. Oh, I didn't even know why we were first. Oh, God. It was the most embarrassing moment. And we're all just standing, died on, and like, hey, you guys okay? You guys, I, I remember the... I think the British right behind us, and boy, they just were like, oh, it's only 26 more miles, guys. Hang in there. <laughs> there. I was like, you know what? He's hurt. We should just let him let him die. <laughs> you know, Saunders, God bless. I mean, here's the thing. If you're going to march for 25 miles, the best thing to do is to be done marching. So it takes you 8, 9, 10 hours. However long. If it takes you 12 hours, there's no time to recover. Like, you just want to go get into your rack, go to sleep, rest up, get food, get water, and get ready for the next day. And Saunders the day before was stopping every two hours for an hour, and we were just never going to make it. And so the group totally exploded apart because it was every person for themselves. So our times were terrible because it took them so long to get back. And, uh, and then, you know, here I am in my, my recovery sleep. I've been asleep for a few hours. I'd really pushed hard that day to get done because I was so aggravated by Saunders. And he comes in and wakes me up from this recovery deep deep sleep and he's like pete pete i made it and i wanted to strangle him oh i wanted to strangle him so bad because he was just <laughs> so horrible it was hilarious actually we were sprinting you were way up i don't i think phil was a uh, way 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 up front I, it was me you phil and then uh lieutenant rosinski and another lieutenant was there i can't remember his name uh and a couple other people and uh yeah yeah but we were basically running the whole thing yeah, it was uh, ridiculous. And then that last day, yeah, it was just like, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. You know, we just we took off going fast. And, uh, you know, that guy, Lieutenant Drew, I can't remember his last name, but but he was had tendonitis for like the next 18 months. You know, it, it was an easy thing to do. And, uh, boy, Saunders was just killing us. I'm, I'm glad we all got through it, though. What do you remember about people finishing that day? It's, it's, you know, you got to hit your hand uh, like 300 times. You can either do it really quickly. Oh, or you can just smash your hand for hours and hours and hours, you know, and get it over with. Just smash it as many times as you can, and, and like that's really kind of the mentality of it. And uh, yeah, that was probably the funniest experience in my military career. So one of the things I remember was we would be walking along, and you know, there's hundreds of people all around us, and nobody's in formation. There's civilians, there's different military units. Hell, the Swedes were in the side of the road. They're partying out a bar, and we're all about business and everything on hiking. But the pain ball, remember the pain ball, Brian, where like all of a sudden someone would start limping, and they just grab their thigh, and then they'd get better, and all of a sudden someone else would grab their shoulder. And then it was like just, just these little micro injuries that would happen and be over within a couple of seconds. And listen, I'm not mad at Saunders. You know, he was trying his best. He dug deep and none of us knew any better. I, if I had been the one that had gotten hurt, um, you know, I likely would have kept pushing too. So I can't blame him for that. And let's not forget, he did totally change his, he trained the hardest. And then right as we were going, he's like, I bought new boots and I wrapped my feet so I won't get blisters, which is the hundred percent the wrong thing to do. Well, he's, he's a good guy. Nothing wrong with him at all, but just, uh, yeah, the, if something could go wrong, he could find a way to make it happen. Though. So wait, so I talked you into nine Megan. I mean, I know we met and I was helping organize it, but I didn't realize I had talked you into it. You, you talked me into it? Yeah, yeah. It was pretty easy talk. I was like, hey, we're going to go march up in the uh, Netherlands. I was like, oh, another country I've never been to. Let's go. So yeah, it was two seconds. And you also were good with the uh, local relations because didn't you pick up a girlfriend who knit you a sweater out there in Dutchland? <laughs> I think I was on the block next to some Dutch girl, and I'm like, you're very pretty. She's like, you're very handsome. And then we just started kissing. And uh, I, I ran into her, the I think, the next day, too. And uh, she gave me her number. And, uh, yeah, and then, and then we, uh, I went up to visit her in, in uh, Holland. We dated for a little while on and off. 
But uh, she was really sweet. She uh, she sent me letters while I was in Bosnia. And, uh, Don't forget the sweater. And a sweater. A really nice sweater. Really nice sweater. It didn't fit me right at all, but uh, it was all hand-knitted, uh, itchy as hell, and the neck was too tight. But uh, a beautiful sweater. It's all really nice. She was a really sweetheart. I, I, I don't know where she is now. We lost touch after a long because this is bef- honestly this is actually before like email was like even a thing. Um, so yeah, I got my my first email address like six months later. So I, uh, unfortunately, Facebook, you know, obviously never existed. So, but it would be nice to see. You. I'd hope she's well and happy and stuff like that. I, we kind of lost touch over the time. So let's go back in time a little bit. How how does a, a you know a left leaning liberal no good hippie from Boston end up joining the army? I, I know when I joined, the economy was really bad. And it was hard to find a job, but I, I don't know what your story is. Uh, no, I planned it out for quite a while. I, I, I said probably six months beforehand. I was like, I'm going to go join up. Uh, it was kind of my plan at the end of my uh, end of college. There, uh, I, I went down the day after I graduated and signed up. So yeah, it was uh, it was something I planned on. It was, it was kind of funny though how I went up in the army though. When I went to sign up, it was one of those they had a recruiting thing where you had all four branches right sitting so, like each one in the corner of the room, so they all facing each other, right? And like you know, and like you walk in there and it's kind of like ooh, and like and each one's like come on over here, come over here, and like you. So I wound up sitting with each each one except for the Marines, ironically, because he was on on leave, and uh, you know I, I met with the Air Force and they're like, yeah, you're way too big and fat to fly an airplane. And I was like, oh, all right. Uh, and I met with the uh, the Navy, and he was wicked sketchy. He's uh, hey, promising me the world. And, and I met with the Army guy. He's like, look, I already made quota this month. Uh, and he's like, and and so I actually, the, the, you take this test to join the military. What's it called? The uh, ASFAB or something like that? Yeah, it's called the ASFAB for sure. I took the ASFAB, and I think I got like 100 on it. But like a, I don't think I got any questions wrong. And uh, he's like, man, you've got a really high score here. Uh why don't you take the book home and you tell me what you want to do? And uh, so he gave me the book and I brought it home and I said, boy, this looks cool. Spy. I'll be a spy. And I brought him back to the, I brought the book back to him and I said, oh, look, I want to be a spy. And uh, he said, uh, I don't know anything about that. Uh, I'll, I'll send up a thing. And, uh, and he said, look, uh, he says, I can get you in that, but it won't be for another three months because there's not a whole lot of us in the military. There are not a whole lot of us uh, signed up for it. So they had to, you know, kind of staggered, you know, joining things. So I, I wound up having to wait three months, but then I got what I wanted. Boy, was I lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Lucky for sure. So my story is similar. I, I, I got out and I would say I was pushing shopping carts in the rain at Costco and I'm like, something's got to change. And me and this other college grad, we just couldn't get any traction with finding a job. So we were talking early one morning when we were doing uh, some stocking for Costco and he's like, I think I'm going to go join the army and become a spy. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And then that day I was out there in the rain and, and pushing carts. And I, just, I didn't have any experience, so I couldn't get a job. And I couldn't get a job to get any experience. So I was like, something's got to change here. And that was when I was like, I, I'm just going to go check it out. And that's what I did. I literally went and just checked it out to see what was going on with it. And uh, I think if my recruiter had been anybody different, it would never have worked. He didn't trick me or anything. Actually, he didn't even care. Like your guy, he's like, I'm done. My recruiting tour is over, so you know I don't care if you sign up or not. And basically, what I told him was, "Don't bug me. Let me think about it for about a month, and then I'll have an answer for you." And but if you bug me, I'm not going to do it. He didn't care. And so a month later, I'm like, "Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do it." And like the day I left for the army, he was packing up his bags to go on to the next assignment. He did suggest that I could possibly play softball on the base team because I played a lot of softball back then, but uh, that turned out to not be true. How wrong he was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, same, same deal. Uh, yeah, really, really did not have an aggressive approach with me at all. And, like, uh, uh, rarely followed up on me. You know, it was really funny. It's because, like, uh, after I got out, you know, we had the whole 9-11 thing. And uh, uh, I, I got out right before it happened. Like, I, you know, uh, I got out in, in uh, 99. And so, obviously, 2001 it happened. But you're on uh, active, you know, uh, inactive ready reserve. And I got calls about once a week. They're like, hey, we're going to bring you back. Oh, we're going to bring you back. We're gonna, you better sign up. We're going to bring you back. And I'm like, well, you just come and get me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was, I was not keen on the whole like, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, that's interesting. Uh, so let, let's change gears again. And let's talk a little bit about some of the things you actually did as an actual spy. Now that we know why you signed up and, and you know, we, the first thing you did was went on a long country walk in Holland. What, what do you think is like the crowning achievement for you? I mean, you deployed to Bosnia, but you're an ops guy. And it turns out that probably suits you well. 
you know, a planner, a guy who's making sure the guys in the field have what they need. But what would you say is the best thing? And you can't say it's the picnic table that you built. You know, what's really funny. I thought the heyday of my thing was uh, uh, I got thrown into operations twice. So once the first time I went there, I went as part of operations. And I, I'd say my heyday there was uh, I was the most junior soldier of the bunch. And uh, I had uh, Phil, who was uh, had he had time in on me, but his rank of me, he's a specialist also. And then I had Sergeant Dunscombe, who not only time on me, but rank on me. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, know I, I guess I'll have to say I did such a good job with operations that uh, Narmi, uh, Chief Officer Narmi and uh, Chief Warrant Officer Garland said, uh, look, uh, Dynamite, you're going to report to Specialist Fuller from now on. <laughs> Yeah, and, and let's understand, this is a pretty big deal. Normally, bosses aren't made to be the underlings of underlings, but that's exactly what happened in your case, and it is that's definitely something I don't know anybody else having that happen where you get switched places like that. That's pretty damn good. So I, I was a specialist, and I had a, uh, an NCO reporting to me because uh, I was the most, uh, I guess, put together out of the three of us. You know, Phil, had, uh, Phil was not a dumb guy at all, very sharp guy, had no business being in the military at all. Uh, you know, and and he made it everybody clear to everybody. Said, I will do the, whatever you tell me to do, but I am not going to be in charge of anything. Uh, and it, and uh, he, Phil's a great guy. I love him to death. Good friend still today. Uh, but Darmstadt was just such an idiot. Did so many stupid things, and I had such low morale. Uh, they they put me in charge, of, which is never ever. That's like uh, you could probably count on the time on your hand that that ever happens. A lower ranking guy gets in charge of a higher ranking guy, and uh, yeah, that was, that was that was actually pretty good honor. And then the second time was uh, they sent me back to Bosnia, and uh, they told me I was going to be part of AFIB or a AMIB, or whatever it is, you know, the British version of us, right? They, they gave me papers, and I went to go sign in with AMIB, and they're like, oh, we don't have you on our books, but we'll gladly take you, you know, we'll, we'll be real excited. And, uh, and then they couldn't get a process. And then this other group that was from uh, Fort Hood were like, no, 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 we claim you. And so I wound up being, I wound up was kind of unassigned for like two weeks. I wouldn't sign in with the Fort Hood guys, because I was told it was going to be part of AMIB, which was a much better deal. Uh, so finally, I begrudgingly signed in with AMIB, and uh, the, the sergeant major in charge of Fort Hood's intel was so mad at me. He's like, we are going to shit on you like crazy for the next six months. Expect you to be wiping down the motor pool and, like, you know, raking up landmines. And, like, he was pretty pissed at me for refusing to sign in to him because i was told two different things i was confused and i was trying to reach back to my own command and like finally they were just like why don't you sign with him for hood we'll just call it a day and i was like all right well if that's what you want me to do i'll do that so i signed with Fort Hood. he was pissed at me and uh they assigned the night shift in ci operations and there was a uh, three of us and so they, they had ci operations 24 hours a day because that's how fort hood runs you know like so obviously there's a lot of night stuff going on you know whatever uh and uh, so I took it upon myself to then uh, take all the information I've been collected over the last two or three years and start to correlate it. And uh, I have my guys like working, you know, like uh, nine at night to like six in the morning, like retyping up reports and filing them and then coordinating them together. And, and I actually put together like it's kind of like a blue book of like everything that's going on in Bosnia by the yeah, operations for the last three years. And I had them all organized into like, here's all the, the people of interest that like this person saw and this person saw and started to make like a, a link diagram chart. And, and like, I got to tell you, uh, the sergeant major, I mean, the sergeant major who hated my guts for not like, you know, jumping on board with Fort Hood at the end of probably four months there, five months there, he said, you know, Sergeant Fuller, you're doing a damn good job here. I, uh, I want to put you out in the field. And then he put me out in the field and assigned me to uh, Sergeant Harrington and one officer, God, I can't remember his name. Well, anyway, so he assigned me to them out into a field post. And uh, they already had all their connections and stuff like that. They've been out there for a while. And I sort of was like a tag along. But they were so effed up. <laughs> like, all they well get shit-faced with their sources and like, and the, and the officers that were in charge of them, the Fort Hood officers, hated them, hated the two of them. And they really liked me. And they, they, they forced me to be with them. And they, the, the Harrington and his warrant officer didn't like me either. Uh, Harrington and I, uh, we're friends, but we were kind of a rough friend. And uh, uh, the warrant officer, he was nice enough about it, but like he was just such a fuck nut. Like they wound up getting 
they want them getting relieved of their their duties and like sent to do something else. And then I didn't have it. I wasn't attached to anything else because I didn't have my own warrant officer. So I wound up doing kind of operations there too. <laughs> but yeah, so that was kind of a. That's probably the high point in my military career. It's funny, though, the way things work like that. Like, you know, people claiming you like, oh, no, we want that guy. He's a CIA asset. And uh, they don't know what to do with you. They just want you. And so, yeah, that, you know, the Fort Hood guys claim you, but you don't really belong to them. They don't really want to take care of you. They just want to have someone there to do certain work. And, and, and you know, it doesn't surprise me at all that you figured out a way to shine. And then, yeah, you go out to a team. Everybody's like, yeah, go out to the field and have a great time. But uh, un- unless you're able to do what you need to do, which obviously you're not able to do. These guys are already out getting drunk and, and doing what has to get done. Uh, yeah, you're, you're mostly just spinning your wheels and not surprising at all that you got back into operations. Let's, uh, the military stuff's fun, but one of the most incredible things about you is this rowing across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, how the heck did you get into rowing? And you know what? Just go from there. Yeah, so I, you know, I joined this program that offered free rowing for veterans. It was a brand new program. I don't think there was anything like it in the country. And I was a third adopter. There was a couple of young guys there from came back from Iraq. And then, I, of course, I came back from Bosnia. And uh, and I, to me, it was like a, uh, it was like a re- revelation. It was like a, it was an eye-opening experience. Like around these other veterans. And, and, and rowing is a lot like the military. You get up early. You have kind of a mission. You're going to row. You, you have to do it in a group. You have a commander. You know, and I do this, do that, you know, and you come back and do a little after action review. This is what we did well, this is what we didn't do well. And it, it kind of just clicks with military people. Uh, not to say we're great, great rowers, but like the whole concept of it really clicks, clicks really well. And I was like, man, this is just an amazing program. I'm so grateful that it's free. I didn't have a lot of money. Uh, and uh, I really took to it. And I wanted to promote the program. So I said, well, look, I'll, I'll do something totally insane so I can get my, my, name in the newspaper and stuff like that. And then I can talk about this other program. And that's, that's essentially what I did. I, uh, I wound up joining a team. We, we rode across the Atlantic ocean in, in 2012 and we did a really good job. We came in uh, third of all time. We, we won the race that year. That's called a, it's called the Atlantic challenge. We, we won that our race that year, but we were third best of all time. And uh, in our particular boat style, we, we hold the record for the fastest cross, and and I want to be in the fastest American to ever cross, and only because not a lot of Americans do this. Yeah, it was it was a really exciting thing, and, and it just gave me an opportunity to promote the program. So that was uh, that was kind of that. And are you still the fastest American to row across the Atlantic, or do you know? As far, as far as I know, no one's and until someone tells me otherwise. I keep having bragging rights. Uh, the den- possible deniability because I haven't really checked, but uh, they, they don't really keep track of those kind of things. Yeah, I had to actually had to do a little research. My the, the the captain of my boat for all his faults. It was really nice of him to do a little research and said, you know what, Brian, you're going to be the fastest American. And then he turned to the uh, my my friend uh, Toby at the time and this other guy uh, Neil, uh, and he said, oh, by the way, you're going to be the fastest Kiwi and you're going to be the fastest Australian. <laughs> <laughs> so we had three fastest guys there, and then we had a, one other guy who was a, a paraplegic. He uh, didn't have a leg. He went the fastest uh, guy with a uh, with the with the prosthetic leg. Wow! And, and he rode across the ocean with you guys. That, that's incredible. It never ceases to amaze me how you know handicapped is such a different thing now. You know, someone's out there just rowing across the ocean, and how many people have ever even done that? There's just got to be a few thousand. That's incredible. That's really cool. So give me an idea. What's the typical day? I mean, you're out there. You got a long way to row. There's a whole bunch of you. What's what's a day like? Uh, all right. So any typical day, we row twelve. Actually, actually eleven and a half or twelve and a half hours. Because there was kind of a the way the schedule worked. You were hour on, hour off, hour and a half on, hour and a half off. So kind of the way it fell. Every other day, you rode either one hour more or one hour less. Um, and you just row the whole time. You know, it, it's uh, physically. It's it's not as demanding as you think. Uh, half the people in the boat were not rowers at all. Uh, if anything, I, I was the second most experienced person in the boat uh, as far as like actual time in like a crew boat or sculling. Uh, the captain himself had actually rowed across the Atlantic five other times, but like he was a terrible rower, terrible, and like had terrible form. And he rowed really lightly, very gingerly. Um, uh, the only two real heavy rowers on the board were me and this guy Toby, and then the other teams. Uh, it, it just, it's just, it's funny, the sport, I don't want to call it a sport, the competition attracts, you know, people that have sort of like, uh, uh, we're willing to do something insane. So a lot of people that have rode across the Atlantic Ocean and climbed Mount Everest, or like, 
you know, did something like that, did K2 or something, you know, like, so it was very common to meet other people that uh, doing this kind of thing that had done sort of some, some kind of extreme sports. Like, you know, I think one guy, you know, walked across the Antarctica or something like that. Like, uh, so that's really kind of the people that attracts. So it wasn't exactly rowers. The fact that I had very little rowing experience, it really was not surprising. I think that's more common than not. Uh, but my day-to-day -day life was, you know, uh, row, sleep, row, sleep, row, sleep, row, eat, sleep, row, eat, sleep, row, sleep, 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 you know, that kind of thing. Like, and like the, the, the monotony of it. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero, co-host of the Break It Down Show and fellow producer here at Lions Rock Productions. And I'm proud to announce our newest show coming in January. It's called Justice. Season 1 is going to be a deep dive into some of the cases I personally worked on as a licensed private investigator, and you'll get a unique view into the criminal justice system that may just challenge some of your personal notions about how it should work and open your eyes in ways you never imagined. So keep your ears open for Justice, a brand new podcast coming in January from Lions Rock Productions to iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Row, sleep, row, sleep, row, eat, sleep, row, eat, sleep, row, sleep, sleep, sleep. You know, that kind of thing. Like, and like the, the, the monotony of it, I, you know, I, I don't know. I think at first it's, re it's really painful at first. And then somewhere around day 20, you sort of kind of fall into it. And it doesn't, it's not that bad, actually. You don't come to despise it, though. And then the end sort of just creeps up on you. Uh, so wait, didn't it take you like 25 days to get into, it took you 20 days to get into the groove for a 25 day row. <laughs> like day 25, we realized you're only 500 miles away from Barbados. And you're like, oh my God, that is coming right up. And then wake up one morning, it's right there. You know, it's, and you're like, oh my God, I can see it. Uh, I got to ask the obvious bathroom question. So help me fill in the blank here. So we, we took off really fast. So 500 miles is like, ooh, uh, it was like six, seven days. And, um, yeah, so, like, the first three days, like, you know, the first two days I didn't eat anything. And then, and then you know, it was the third day before I was like, mm, you know, hand me the bucket, it's ready, you know. And, like, uh, like, you really don't have, like, kind of a when do I sleep, when do I eat, you know. Like, uh, you don't have any kind of rhythm down. Like, and, and there's no synergy in the boat at all. Like, you know, everybody wants to do their own thing, uh, you know. So it's, it's, it's kind of hectic. Like, you know, the captain, of the, you know, my biggest fault with the captain is he didn't provide a lot of oversight, you know, like, well, he didn't provide a good model for these kind of things. Like he knew it was going to be Brian right from the start and he didn't like prepare us at all. Uh, like he didn't say, Hey, you need to get two sets of headphones. Like, that's a good idea. You know, like, cause they'll break, you know, you're going to need them or, or, or you're going to need like, you know, uh, manager sleep time like this or like, you know, manager eating like this. You know, all had to kind of figure out as we went along because you know he, he didn't have a whole lot of leadership skills. Now, to be fair, he built a great boat. He got us across safely and, and got us across in, in a really quick time. So, you know, kudos to him regarding those same things like that. Uh, his weaknesses were all the uh, kind of the organizational behavior stuff. So what's the big takeaway from that? I mean, is it out there finding that rhythm on day 20? Is it just getting through the challenge? What's, what's the pinnacle moment and, and uh, you know, the reason why someone does this? Uh, there's no greater experience than when you pull up to shore. It, it's, it's, it's totally euphoric. Uh, and, and looking back, you know, like, you know, I have to say is I'm getting a little older now because I'm, I'm almost 50 now. Uh, life is much more about experiences. And, like, to do something like this that not a lot of people have done is, is really kind of a feather in your hat. Like, you know, I bet you uh, that you love the fact that you served as a spy more, much more now than you ever did when you were in. And uh, it's the same thing with me, with this, with this rolling thing. Like, the rolling across was not a great experience at the time, but looking back, it was a fantastic experience. And the longer I look back, the greater it was. You know, and I even kind of want to do it again now. You know, I'd love to put the captain my own boat because I could see the, the strengths and weaknesses that he had, and, and hopefully I could build on that, you know, and that's a little bit of hubris on my part. But I, I think there's something to be said, like, for having a much more positive, you know, you know, a, a much more organized crew and a little a little more safety standards. He did not really great with safety stuff. But uh, that, that being said, yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I, uh, 
I, I relish the fact that I did it though, because it's, it's something that not a lot of people have done, you know, and, uh, and life is all about experiences. So how about the boat? I mean, is that, how dangerous is that? Are you guys constantly tossing and turning or, or how, how do you, how do you guys do in a storm all by yourselves in a damn rowboat? So the boat is actually super buoyant. So think of like a cork in the water. It never really has any danger at all. Right. So in that, in that regard, those boats are super, uber buoyant. Like me and you could pick up the whole boat and, uh, and and it holds, you know, eight people uh, in food. Uh, so we can still pick it up. Okay. So, I mean, it's light and it's buoyant and everything, but still, like, you know, big swells are big swells. And I remember you talking about how hard it was. You know, is it terrifying out there during a storm? We'd have 70-foot swells. We'd go right up over them, you know, no big deal. Here's the danger, okay? Uh, there's kind of two dangers. Like the boat, the people don't put pontoons on these boats. So they tend to rock back and forth a little bit. The danger is they roll rolls over uh now the boats are all made to be self-writing so they'll write back over but you know your shit's all over the place then and it's, it's a usually if it rolls over you know the weather's pretty effed up uh can we say effed up on what can we say in the air you should say whatever the fuck you want to say so it's pretty fucked up so uh a lot can happen when it rolls over you know like that's gonna be a big problem um most of the boats when they roll once have to be rescued um because uh, we'll get, they're not going to get into the logistics of it, but they tend to take on water, even if they're designed to be sealed shut. Uh, but the real danger is you get blown overboard. Uh, you know, during shift change or something like that, you stand up, a wave hits you, you get knocked overboard. The boats, uh, you have a really low visibility on the boat. So when you stand up, you can only see a certain distance, and it's not that far. And if you're in the water, you can only see about 20 feet, especially if it's it's all waves, right? You know, the uh, waves coming up and down kind of thing. Uh, like little, I don't know, uh, even small waves. I like go four or five foot waves. But something blows you off board, right? And you, you fall into the water. You, you get your head above water. And you turn around, turn around, turn around. And you're like, okay, what direction is the boat? Because you can only see 20 feet. Maybe you start swimming in a direction. Maybe it's the right direction. Maybe it's the wrong direction. In two seconds, you know, that boat's cruising right along. It's 100 feet away. Now you're in the wrong direction now. Right, so now you're 150 feet away. It's only been two minutes. They've stopped the boat now. Now they're actively looking for you, yelling for you, right? But you can't hear anything. None of us wore whistles. You can't really hear anything, uh, even like 20 feet away, because the waves are loud. It's a lot of decibels. So in a matter of seconds, you're now all alone in the in the ocean. And we didn't wear life preservers, so now you're treading water, and it's like big waves. You're treading water. The other boats. Look for you another boat they can't see very far either and so like if the waves are five feet high and you're right at water level you're just your head's above water that hides you infinitely hides you so it may come up a wave and and they can look down they could possibly see you if you're really close but otherwise you're gone and, and that's so danger and uh yeah so if you get blown overboard uh and you're not connected to the boat in some some way uh, we, we wore these little strings that connected to our boat. They, they, they cannibalized them off of uh, paddle, um, off of uh, boogie boards. But, you know, it's just a piece of Velcro. So, like, think of a boogie board weighs five pounds, not, not even two pounds, right? And so you could have all the waves in the world, and that thing's going to hold on to your foot because the thing only weighs two pounds. But a boat weighs 1,200 pounds, you know, with everybody in it, you know. And uh, when that thing pulls away from you, it's, it's my 250 pounds versus the the 1200 pound boat and I'll have a little piece of Velcro on my foot. That thing just snaps off instantly. So uh, it's not like you're going to be tethered to the boat either at all. So that's the real danger. And then, then it just becomes a matter of, can we find you before you drowned? Yeah. There's this guy named Archibald that was on a uh, cruise with his friends for the 50th anniversary or 50th birthday party. And they were out like in the uh, Straits of Jakarta or somewhere. And they're just going from Australia to, to the next place. And uh, one of them was a little drunk, got tipsy in a storm and uh, he went overboard and we did his show on a uh, Mark Pattison show. You guys should check out finding your summit. It's awesome. I produced that show, but uh, he goes overboard and they don't know. They just keep on steaming along steaming. They keep on motoring along. And you know, once you fall into the water, 
your, your head's a big, as big as a coconut, and it's impossible to see, and it's a storm, and it's at night. So they got all the way to their destination before they realized that he wasn't there because, you know, they're a bunch of guys hung over and hanging out. So they turn around, and they navigate back, and, and he's out there for days, days, like 35, 48 hours, something like that, and, and just floating. And he had been sick, so he's already weak from that and dehydrated from puking. And he not, now he's out there in the water. And his friends navigate right by him, and they don't see him. And then going the other direction, this guy learns about him falling overboard. So they go look for him, and they it's like this divine thing where they get just guided by God to go find this guy. And even as they find him, He's so tired. He does this, you know, big like water polo kick so they can see him. He's waving his arms. It's all the energy he has. And they see him and they turn and they're coming to him and they're already pretty close. And then he realizes that's it. That's all the energy I have. And he starts to go under and drown and he can't save himself. And then right as that is happening, one of the guys jumps off the boat goes in and grabs him by the arm and then he recovers and he hops in the boat but he was completely worn out and basically moments from dying they just you know he's like i'm gonna die as they're rescuing me is what he thought and luckily he made it but but that that's that's how harrowing it is to go into open water without a without a life vest on without a whistle without any kind of light to alert anybody a flash light a whistle yeah they should all should be attached to you even like at this point it should be some sort of like gps device at this point you know you're and you know you're within 100 feet of whatever that is and you just keep circling within that 100 feet until you find that like, but i mean those are some safety procedures that, n- that our captain never did but fortunately we never had a problem but uh two two crossings later that exactly that scenario happened a young guy 21 years old got blown overboard boom he, it was rocky waves. They went up and down these little waves. They're only about eight, ten feet tall. But he's gone. In one second, he was gone. They circled, they circled, and circled for three days. Nothing. Couldn't find. Him. And but that's the danger, you know. And there's this young guy, really fit, twenty-one years old, drowned, gone. Yeah. What a, what a terrible way to go. Because like you're, you're all alone now. And I bet if you're a young twenty-one year old guy, you get adrenaline going. You probably tread water for a day. Okay. So. I have a hundred more questions about the ocean, but I don't want to run out of time with you. And I want to make sure that we, uh, we cover this next bit here. But um, if anybody who heard during our veterans week, you were one of our profiled veteran businesses. You, you've um, you and I have done the transition thing. You kind of went your way, my way, but we've been there a long as you became a CPA and you were an assistant, all these reverse osmosis jobs, all these things. And, now you've got it, and I know this is it. It's not. It's not juice anymore. It's nothing down at the Haymarket. You've started a studio called Power Rowing. It's in. It's in Massachusetts. They're basically there in Boston. But um, I want to understand more about it. I'm going to shut up and let you just talk about it. Yeah. So uh, it's really exciting. It's a. It's a kind of a whole new venture. So there's, there's not a lot of rowing studios. There's, there's a bazillion spin studios. That's with a bike. Not a lot of rowing studios. That's with a erg or a rowing machine. Uh, there's probably 25 in the whole country, maybe maybe 30 in the whole country. Starting to spring up more and more though, because uh, uh, it turns out rowing is it's just a very very efficient, low impact exercise. Um, and so I, I, you know, I thought about it and thought about it, and I said, you know what? I, I bet I could bring this to the public, and uh, and I'm trying. You know, like. So I set up a small studio, like 15 machines in Brookline here, and uh, I introduced to the public last, not last August, but the August before, 2017, and uh, it's slowly grown and grown and grown and grown. And, and just just this month, we hit 100 members, and uh, I, we're not quite there. I'm not, you know, I'm not to a place where I'm like, oh, this is it, this has happened, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, we're we're pretty close. We have a really big following. Uh, uh, people really genuinely love it uh culturally we're all about community we do a, a ton of fundraising for like various events and and various causes and as a matter of fact uh this just this last thanksgiving i reached out to everybody i said hey instead of doing a turkey trot why don't you come into a turkey well give me 20 bucks and we'll donate it all to homeless shelter for children and i had 50 people show up on thanksgiving morning now that i think about it, it's actually more than that because we raised 1100 dollars and only has 20 dollars a head um, I, I round it up. I pay a little extra and round it up. But uh, the uh, yeah, I mean, like it, it's crazy. So uh, um, yeah, I'm really excited about like the potential f- 
like where we can go with this because I think that there's a lot of potential here, not just for the rowing thing, but part of the, the community aspect of it. And you know, like there's, I, I don't know. It's just it's been a really a terrific ride. And I'm I just hope that it never ends. Okay, so how bad is your imposter complex? I mean, I know like this isn't supposed to work, right? Most businesses fail. You've tried other things in the past that haven't been the right thing, but this is working. So what what's the toll for the imposter syndrome? Oh my, every day. Like uh, someone will come in and ask me a tough question and I'll you know they're like, "Oh, so what's the right stretch for this muscle in my body?" I'm like, "Fuck if I know. I uh, uh you know, I, I'm not qualified to do that. I'm qualified to do this." And, and and like, and I'm immediately I'm like, oh my God, somebody's going to find out. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And like, people will call me I'm like, hey, I, I want a private class with you. No, I don't, I'll pay the hundred dollars for it. And I'm like, why would you want a private class with me? I don't know what the hell I'm doing. You know, and uh, how am I an expert? You know, and like, I started teaching classes to kids and like 10 to 13 years old. And, and like, you know, I'm like, why am I qualified to do this? I, I don't have any studies in like kids studies or anything like that. And boy, the kids love it. You know, people like the private classes. People like the the big classes I hold. They just they can't get enough of it. Uh, you know, I, I've got to like probably about eighteen hundred reviews at this point since I opened, and I, I'm the highest reviewed instructor in, in the Greater Boston. Well, look, that may be a surprise to you, but it is not a surprise to me. You are among the most genuine, trustworthy, hardworking, faithful guys I know. So, so I know that whatever you put your heart into, and and I know this is what you're doing. Of course, you're a great instructor. I mean, you you motivate me all the time. But 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 what is your rating though? Like like how high is it? Oh, like so. I mean, it only comes out of five stars, right? That five stars is the hardest you can get. So I have like a four point nine four review rating out of about eighteen hundred reviews. And uh, I, I you know I I say this with confidence that nobody's higher. No one no one in Boston's higher. Uh, it would be kind of in the ballpark, but no one's higher. It's, it's 100% chance no one's higher. Uh, so whatever I'm doing, like I'm really reaching people in a way that, 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 that people are not accustomed to. And I, and I get people to come in all the time and look, I, I read your reviews and I, I'm a little skeptical, so I had to check it out. Then they wind up leaving the same review. They're like, this is the real deal. Boy, you've got you to try this out. He really will change your life as far as conditioning. And, and, and uh, I've done all kinds of marketing, and my best marketing is word of mouth. And uh, I can't beat it. People come in and they're like, I got to bring a friend in. And like, that's the attitude. And, and like, people don't go to Gold's Gym and they're like, oh man, I got to bring Pete in because Gold's Gym is so great, you know? But people are like that. It's kind of, I don't want to use the word cult, but that's, I, some of my, my own guests use that word once in a while. Like, I'm part of the cult here. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 we're not a cult. We're not a cult. And they're like, no, 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 it's a cult. And that's good. <laughs> I'm just going to say it again because I get to say it, and I know you won't do it. But, dude, you, you've got impeccable character. You know? I'm a character, but I don't have an impeccable character. I... When we first started to become a spy, one of the things they teach us is that you've got to be above reproach, and, and that's what you are. I mean, you're 100% trustworthy, and, you know, I, I just I think the world of you and what you do and what you stand for, and it's reflecting. And this is why I, I know that you're in the right spot because you're just passionate about this and you know, you're a big, strong dude, and but you're lovable, and and you just have this. I don't know, man. Your your character is as as good as anybody I've ever met, and uh, I'm I'm just proud of you, and and so excited for you. Uh, well, I appreciate that, Pete. And that means a lot to me. Okay, so it's the new year, and people want to work out. And it's easy to get there once, twice, three times, but then you start to fail. Help us understand what does it take? Because you go every day. I mean, granted, it's your job, it's your business, but how do you encourage people to do that next workout? What do, what do you do? Help us out. So everybody anywhere has tried once. You can, oh, I'm going to start this great workout thing, okay? But it's not the first day. That's the hardest one. It's the second day. So now you or you know how hard it's going to be, and you come in a second day. So that's that's where the change really. That's that's the that's the person that's going to make the difference. Okay, so I'll have a million people sign up for new memberships or buy a ten pack or something like that in January, and it's great for my bottom line. But you know, I really want those people to come back, and, and it's it's so tough to get them back. It's the second day that makes all the difference. That's the one that says, you know what, I'm going to make all the difference here. I'm going to I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. You got to it's, you know, when people talk about working out and stuff like that and conditioning, I'm like, you know, it's not necessarily rowing, it's not necessarily spin, it's not, you know, weightlifting, CrossFit, whatever you want to do. 
it's, it's whatever is going to get you to do it. Okay. Now, the things that are more efficient, I, I, you know, rowing, you know, kind of scientifically is one of the most efficient exercises you can do. Low impact, great for bone density. It's all over muscular workout. But forget all of that. Okay. Like, if running is the thing that wakes you up in the morning and says, I got to do it because I'm going to love running, you know, do it. Just do that, you know, or class, you know, you just you connect with the instructor or the music is great, you know, or or maybe Zumba. It doesn't doesn't really matter, you know, but whatever, whatever gets you going, whatever floats your boat. OK, get out there that second time. That's what's important. And you've got to find that as an individual and then you can start to change your life. Yeah, it seems like the thing is, is like just find the simplest thing. If it's just going outside and walking, just get that. Like, whatever it is, even if you're bad at it that day, get out to the gym. Just get to the gym. Just drive there. I mean, everybody can do that, right? Like, ah, oh, you're going to mess around and leave 10 minutes later. Just get to the gym and start trying to make a difference that way. That's, like, the best way to, to make a difference in getting there all the time is is just anything you can do to start. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. Fundamentally, you know, it just you just got to get in there and just got to do it. You know, I, I one guy I like to talk about all the time. His name's Ed. He came in. He's sixty eight years old, and we had this workout. It's like a three minute workout, right? And it doesn't sound like very long, but rowing is hard, you know. And uh, he could never finish his three minute workout when he first came in. He he's almost looks a little bit like the guy from the movie Up, like Ed Asner. And uh, he stuck with me for about four months before he moved away. And he came in three days a week religiously. And at first he could do a minute and then he could do a minute and a quarter and a minute and a half. And at the end of two and a half months, uh, he was doing a full three minutes and he was working on improving that time to see how far he could go, you know? And, uh, he turned to me and said, boy, I, I don't know what to say, but I'm, I'm in the best shape I've been in in 20 years. And, uh, he was 68 years old. So, uh, there's a little to that, you know, like just put one, one more word on that page, one more word on that page, you know, and we'll figure it out. We'll get it all going together, you know, and uh, he, he did it. He did it. And, uh, you know, that's a story I like to tell all the time. Wait, it only takes three minutes to do the workout, though? Or help me understand that. That seems like that's super short. Are you like like two minute abs, that kind of thing? Oh, you know what? So not to get into too many details, but the science is much, much more about instead of length of time, uh, duration of your workout, it's much more about intensity. intensity, 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 intensity. So we talk a lot about getting the heart rate right around a, right around 85 to 90 percent, 85, 90 percent. Your heart rate around 85, 90 percent, your body starts to react and says, oh my gosh, boy, we, we've got to make some fundamental changes. I mean, I could talk your ear off about kind of like why this happens, but that, we could save it for a whole other show. But, uh, yeah, it's it's about the intensity of your workout, and in three minutes, you can get your heart rate gassed. I mean, just cooked. It's like equivalent to like running up a hill, you know, or running upstairs. In three minutes, you're running upstairs. You're done. Uh, and and rowing is a lot like that because so many muscles are activated. Uh, that's a lot of oxygen to pump to throughout your body. And uh, when that happens, uh, you know, your heart's like, oh my gosh, we got to make this happen. We got to make this happen. And in three minutes, you can really do some changes. It's it's a little longer than three minutes. Like you got to get warmed up, and you probably got to get your heart rate going and get all the all the joints loose and everything else, right? So, all right. So, uh, yes, yes and no. But get get ready for that, though. So, a typical class is forty five minutes long. To get ready for that three minute challenge, we'll warm you up for a half hour. So that that that's part of the challenge. So you 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 can't just just hop on the machine and just do three minutes of intense work. Your body's not ready for it. So there's a half hour process of getting it ready. So uh, we, we look at those things and, uh, we, you know, we prepare your body to then perform and then you perform. Uh, but that preparation process is so key to it because people will skip that and they get hurt. You know, their muscles aren't warmed up. They, they can't, they go to push themselves. Their scores aren't very good because your body is still warming up in those three minutes. Uh, you'll find your scores are much, much, much better if you take at least 15, 20 minutes to warm up. And is it just one big, hard three-minute pull, or, or is it a series of them? I mean, is it like uh, uh, intervals are you doing, or how, how does it work? Well, think of it as a button, okay? You press that button, you you activate something in the body that says, okay, we need a response, right? So we actually press that button like three times. So we do three three-minute challenges. Make sure we get there, okay? Uh, it's all about telling your body 
uh, we need to make some changes. We need to make some changes. So if you press that button once, your body's like, oh, oh yeah, we'll do that. And you press it twice, it's like, oh yeah, oh, yeah, we got it, got it, got it. You press it that third time, it's like, oh my, all right, we got it. We're trying to make those changes. So I, I tell people, come in four classes in two weeks and look me in the eye and tell me you don't feel like you have more energy. And I've yet to have anybody turn to me and say, you know what, I don't feel more energy. I, but every single person that's come in, I've given that challenge to. We don't ever talk, you know, lose 10 pounds in 10 weeks, nothing like that. We don't. We don't do things like that, or we're going to build abs in 10 weeks or anything like that, right? I say, you look me in the eye and tell me you don't have more energy. And that's the challenge towards people. And I think that's a much better representation because I have no control over what you eat. Uh, you know, I have no control over your physique or anything like that. But I have, but I can help control where your cardio is. And, you know, I got people that come to me and they're like, you know, I'm no longer on, uh, you know, cholesterol pills. I'm no longer, uh, you know, uh, my heart rates, you know, my resting heart rates dropped by 15 points, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff like that, you know, uh, because that's stuff that we can control, you know, students are either going to lose weight with them, you know, they have no control over those kind of things. I don't know why they, 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 they make those, make those, you know, uh, statements saying, oh, you're going to get much skinnier here, you know, for, for spring. You know, maybe you will, maybe you won't. I don't know. I mean, I have, like I said, I have no control of the, the real factor is what you eat. So are you going to start doing some kind of remote coaching or videos or, or, you know, I mean, like, heck, Diamond Dallas Page made most of his money on yoga. Coming. It's coming. Let me, let me make a little profit here first. And then coming. a lot of people are asking me for that. They want the videos. Uh, you know, and, and it's, it's funny. I, I remember uh, when I was a kid, I, uh, Billy Blank was a big deal doing the whole uh, he, he had a studio in, in Los Angeles, and the studio did very well. It was a huge studio, but he'd fill up 50 people, and they'd do this whole class with him. He, he made all his money off the video, so. And, and I, there's something to be said for that. Uh, clearly, you know, from my reviews, this is where the imposter syndrome comes in. People seem to like me. They want this, the product they want that I'm presenting. And so I'm trusting those things to say, at some point, I'll, I'll do this, the video process. Uh, it's coming. So it's coming, but it's not there yet. Up till now, they got to just visit us in Boston or, you know, get a room machine of your own, uh, you know, and, and if they want to reach out to me and they need a workout, I can walk them through something, you know, and not that way. Are you going to expand soon? Let me ask you that. Are you going to expand? 30 more and, uh, and I can say, you know what, it's time for me to step away from this a little bit. Uh, 30 more and I need to hire five more great people. And, and up till now, I haven't made any effort to hire new great people. They all come to me and I've just been very fortunate i've got nothing but awesome trainers they all get great reviews they're really fantastic uh but it's on me to i have to find another five you know to, it can't just be the brian fuller show it's got to be the power rowing show and uh uh right now i out of the 50 classes we teach a week probably 30 so maybe, maybe more maybe 38 uh so it has to be something more than just the brian fuller show and uh i have to you know kind of let these guys go for more, but I need more people and to pay for those people. Well, well that's going to happen. I mean, look, you're a great leader. You inspire people to work out. You're going to inspire people to show up and help out. I, I have no doubt about that. It's just going to take time. And, and the next thing you know, you're going to have to bust down the walls in that place. And then you're going to have to go get another one. I, I just know it. What have you learned? What have you gained? What, what how have you been enriched? By this whole thing there's something that's unexpected that's happened and and you have come to appreciate that probably as much as anything else what's that thing you know when i first started the studio i guess you know uh, i knew that i wanted to do some community stuff but i had no idea it would become like the community like like people like if you go to a spin class or something like that or yoga class you know uh you get done with the class you're like okay everybody out and like everybody's gone in two minutes and like you get done with one of my classes and there's like a lobby area and like everybody hangs out there for like 10 minutes 20 minutes and they've all become good friends and like a lot of people like i didn't know anybody in brooklyn village now i know 100 people and uh i've become like a networking hub that was not something i was expecting like people come to me in there uh, so I, I get it quite a bit they're like oh how do you feel about this or what about this can we do this through here and i'm like and I'm always trying to find the answer. Yes, uh, yeah, I, that was not a part I was expecting. I was expe I was expecting people to to want to do this workout because they wanted the workout, and they they love this place not 
just for the workout, but much, much more for for the community aspect. And I didn't know that I was a community organizer before I started this. And it turns out that's probably what I'm best at. Well, look, I can't wait for you to expand to Orange County so I can get myself a leotard and get up there in front of a class and help you grow the business. I just, I think the world of you, Brian, and, and I know that you're doing great things because I just, as much as, as long as I've known you and as well as I know you, this is the one thing that just, it's perfect. You were great at this, everything about your character and it's, and you deserve the success, man. I, I really, I think the world of it and uh, I know, I know already that this is going to continue to be a hit for you. I think that might be true. I think it might be true. So I think that that's the one area where I, I, I guess I can claim I'm not an imposter. Yeah, man, for sure. I'll confirm it for you. You're not an imposter, but you are my friend and my lifelong friend at that. Hey, listen, everybody, you guys got to go check out Brian. If you're in Brookline, Mass, grab some sticks and get to rowing. Uh, look for his studio. It's called Power Rowing. He's, he's going to be coming around. And we're going to have him on the show more, too, because... I, I just can't get enough of them. i got to find a reason to come out to Boston. And Look, I just can't wait to talk to you again, Brian. Thank you so much for coming on. Hey, thanks so much, Pete. And I hope to talk to you again soon.